Brother Walt literally, I mean, he literally brings to the table the, uh, <laughs> the rubber meeting the road, so to speak. You know, what does denying yourself mean? What does that mean? You know, Brother Gary has shared it week after week. There's a difference between a reason and an excuse. All right. I was driving to car. I was dri I was coming to church and my tire went flat. And man, I had been out there. I apologize for being so nasty, but I had to change it. That's a reason. All right. Uh, staying on my phone too long this morning and it made me 25 minutes late. That's an excuse. All right. That's not a reason. All right. That's an excuse. There's so many things that literally we can think of. And what is denying me? You know, it, it, there, there is a massive amount of denial, even into the ministry, but literally as a lay person and our ability and our effort that we put into serving him, you know, it takes great effort. Well, you know, I get up so early, it's just hard for me to read first thing in the morning. But that's an excuse. Yeah. All right. Because there was times that I, when I worked at the manufacturing plant, we went in at 450, didn't we, Brother Jim? That's right. All right. We were there with our tools out on the station, ready to start working at 450. Did you mean you got up and read your Bible? I sure did. Yep, I did. Too. Was, it, was it with great effort that that happened? <laughs> yes. Because I knew that meant me burning. I mean, you're, you're, you're sitting here trying to get all the sleep you could get in. And you're like, no, you know what? I esteem the riches of Christ greater and precious to me more than I do that other 30 minutes of sleep. Yep. And you get up, start your day off with prayer. And you know the days that I would think, I just don't have time. I'll catch it at first break. Oh, son, from the time I got there till first break was horrible. Yep. And I'm like, whew, I couldn't wait for first break to get there so I could dig in there and at least get me five or six verses of scripture for me to chew on. And then I began to adopt this thing. No Bible, no breakfast. I need this food much more than I need this food. And, and, and once I adopted that, then it, it began to permeate and become a part of my life. Now, was I always like that? No. It literally is a process that God begins to work on you and teach you that denying me sometimes means that I'm going to take and push aside this opportunity of time and Lord, I'm devoting it to you. That's what fasting is. Fasting is, Lord, you're more important than even eating. I'm pushing this aside because I need to focus on you. And that literally begins to permeate our lives as a lay person, as a, as a minister. Uh, as a minister, I, I, I remember back missionaries that came uh, when I was at Calvary, this one specific one. He was like the head guy at IBM. And I forget how much, uh, it, it was an enormous amount of money the fellow made. He said, literally, for an IT specialist, I was where everybody dreams of being. And until one night I was at church, God got a hold of me. I looked at my wife, tears running down my wife's cheeks, and we knew we had to just come up here, lay it down, and leave. He said, so I went in, Brother Chris Redmond. Uh, he, he is the one that literally coined the term, if you see a turtle on a post, you know we had some help getting there. And, and he said, literally, I was at ORNL, Oak Ridge National Laboratories. He said, I was in a job I shouldn't have been at. He said, there was people around me that was incredibly blessed with, with, with smarts. But it seemed like every time I would go in and say, I'm not going to have a part of this. Well, you know, it, it could mean you lose your job. Well, that's so being. If that's the case, so be it. But I am not going to partake of this. If that's not scriptural. He ended up getting a promotion. <laughs> and then all the way to the point that when he, when he surrendered to the ministry, literally to God, he, his, his focus right now is still to go to Haiti and build churches. And he goes into ORNL and turns in his resignation. And people around me is like, are you crazy? How old are you? You're not old enough to retire. And he said, I, I'm not retiring. 
I'm just changing occupations. I'm going to serve the Lord full time. And uh, it is an amazing thing. It, it's, it's easy for us to get wrapped up in what this world, and that's be on in our morning message, what this world has to offer. And once we began to love those things that the world offers more than you love the Lord, then those things began to permeate and control me. And that's when that we just start fitting Jesus in where he works in. Well, let me see. Let me see. Let me see if I can pencil the Lord in here and I'll let him, I'll, I'll see if I can't pencil him in and fit him into a few slots. Mm -mm. Denying yourself, taking up your cross and following him means everything else has got to fit into his slots. He don't fit into nothing. He has to become my all in all. And you know, I, I hear these songs say, he is my all in all. You know, and, and then it just goes to a beautiful song that people worship on and they sing. And I'm thinking, do you really have a clue what that means? He becomes my all in all and everything else of the world has to fit into him. Well, our whole world system doesn't work like that. That's exactly why God says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Why? Because the world system says, you dive off and run after me. And if the Lord fits in, so be it. But whenever that you come to these passages of Scripture, he says, no, that's not the way it works at all. You deny yourself. Oh, yeah, but that's just for preachers. Mm -mm. Oh, you deny yourself. Oh, but that's just for missionaries. No, it's for all of us. Because all of us are tempted by the things of the world. And these things of the world are the things that's trying to get us to run off after them. And... We take and put the Lord fourth, fifth, or sixth. You know, you've heard it said before. If he ain't number one, I guarantee you he ain't number two. Yeah. Why? Because we're running after the things of the world, and he is like that hand. What I really want to chase is on top, and then I have these other things that fit in, and then the Lord's the little one down on the bottom dangling in. Well, that's exactly opposite of what this verse is teaching us. <laughs> Look once again, verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, I know you've seen it over here on 27. That doesn't mean go home and, 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 and nail you some wood together and go dragging it and walking it up down Highway 27. I saw people do that. But that's not what that talks about at all. It just means... Uh, you know, you've heard the old saying, put your money where your mouth is. All right. Well, I've confessed with my mouth the Lord Jesus. Now act like it. Put your money where your mouth, put your faith where your mouth is. Take up your cross and follow me. He's got to become number one. Well, how do I do that? Denying myself. What does that mean? That means things that I would spend time serving me, I'm going to push aside and I'm going to serve him. Now, Brother Gary has already pointed this out, and this is the thing that I really think we ought to get. It's no different if, if I, uh, I've got an automobile out here, and if I drive by the fuel station and I fill it up, it's literally silly of me to think that it's going to last forever. It's not going to last forever. My tank, the fuel's going to run down in my tank. My light's going to come on, and I'm going to run back by the fuel station, and I'm going to fill it up again. That's exactly why when you go to the Gospel of Luke in chapter 10, he says, take up your cross daily and follow him. All right? So how, how often do I deny myself? You see, I, and I, I've shared this over this past year, and it seems to be something the Lord's really teaching me. It, it, is, it is one of those things that we get in our mind that we remember back the date that we got saved. Praise the Lord for that. I'm glad there was a time. All right, but we literally run back in our in our in our lives to that time, and we think right then's when it started. I'm done. I'm good now. Mm -mm. That ain't when it started. That's just when it began. Right. Now I begin to grow. Well, what's the first thing I need to do? Was a born again believer. My first step of obedience is baptism. That's why we had six baptized last week. 
Then I say, all right, now what shall I do? Matthew chapter 6 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What do I do? Seek him. He's got to be first. The, well, I did that that one time way back there, remember? No, no, I didn't, that's not what Luke 10 says. It says, take up our cross daily, daily. and follow him. Well, how, how often do I have to deny myself, Brother Larry? Uh, how, try daily. <laughs> daily. Every morning I get up. I'm going to have fresh tempt. I'm going to have old temptations staring me in the face. I'm going to have new temptations that I've not even seen before that are going to peer their old ugly head. And then I have got to stay focused and laser focused on him. A little bit, a lot of our morning message is going to be talking about what hinders us in our lives from being able to do that. What hinders us in our lives from doing that? I'm telling you, I tell you, there's a lot of, um, I think Midnight Cry, if I'm not mistaken, they sang, they sang a song and it stuck with me. It says, I found out without a doubt my trouble's walking in my shoes. I'm my own worst enemy. There ain't nobody, if I didn't come to church, it's my fault. There wasn't no excuse, it's my fault. If, if I don't read my Bible, guess whose fault it is? It's my fault. If I don't pray, guess whose fault it is? Think about these verses on prayer. And you've heard me say this. I feel like a broken record, but 1 Thessalonians 5 says, pray without ceasing. All right? It also says, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And because of that, if I don't give thanks and I'm not praying, then why, whose fault is it? It's mine. And because it's mine, then God's going to hold me personal, personally responsible for not doing that. And therefore... Here's the question we've got to ask in parallel with the context of this passage. Okay, so if I'm not praying like I should, and I'm not studying, and I'm not serving him, and I'm not growing, and you won't grow if you don't read your Bible because it's the milk. And if you don't have the milk, you can't grow. All right? And therefore, so if I'm not, if I'm not doing these things, the question comes, well, well, if I'm not doing these things, what am I doing? And then whatever I'm doing, I'll guarantee you, I'm serving me. It's something I want to, well, I, I didn't do that because I was doing something I wanted to do. Well, wait a minute. As a born again believer, I literally should have a full out desire to serve him daily. And I'm telling you, I remember going soul winning one uh, Saturday morning. We had met down in Graceville, Brother John Gardner from Amazing Grace Mission. He and I met down there. This is when his dad had started. To, his dad had been uh, president of the mission for a long time. Brother John was just trying to be a faithful Christian. And he showed up. And Brother Cliff that came, he, all three of us met down there. And we, we went out to go soul winning that morning. And I'm telling you, son ever unbelievable excuse in the world I, I, I tried to come up with but I, and, and, and I'm arguing on the way down there I'm driving down there man you know what else I could be doing today Lord man what if they ask me a question and I don't know it and, and I'm just sitting here arguing with the Lord all the way there and I get there and I see brother John and he's just so happy and chipper and, and I was like I gotta ask you a question and he said, what? And I said, man, I tell you, I, it just feels like it's so hard to get here. Well, why, brother? And I said, well, it, it just, there's, there's a thousand things I need to be doing right now. I said, and you act like it's so easy. And he stopped and got real serious and looked. And he said, it's not. He said, I am faced with the same temptations you are. And that's to stay at home and not come to stay at home and not come. And he said, I, I, I literally argue with myself all the way here. And I said, yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Well, don't feel like the Lone Ranger. Right. Because all of us are stuck in this body of flesh. Yep. And this body of flesh <laughs> wants to do what this body of flesh wants to do. And then we pick up this holy Bible that teaches me to deny myself. Are you kidding? But I like doing this. 
Well, some of those things aren't even bad. It just literally, we put it before God, and God says, you can't do that. You've got to, it's okay to do them. I give them to you, you know, but you've got to keep them in perspective here and keep me number one. And it is so easy to think sometimes, well, there's nobody else struggling with this but me. Oh, I promise you. I promise you. It is a, it is, I, you have to be disciplined. You ever see somebody that works out? I, I know folks, I know Brother Barry, you, you think back of folks that religiously has worked out over the years, literally for the last 30, 40 years of our lives, and they're still working out. And you're like, man, why is that so easy for you? And the first thing they're going to tell you is like, this ain't easy. This takes up my time. There's things I want to do. But they're disciplined enough that they constantly, they eat right, they work out, and they take care of their sleep. And that takes discipline the same way as a born-again believer. And you know, there's, there's so many books that I've read that you go back and you read great revivals of the past. And you read what these people did. Yeah. Well, God led those folks to do that. And they did it because they were following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And God was leading them to pray and to call certain meetings and to have certain fastings. And, and then all of a sudden, it's easy for us to take out our tablet and we write down, well, well if they did that and it worked, yeah. well, I'm going to do it too. And you write down and you just start literally following the sequence of events that they did. And then you step back and say, no, wait a minute. It didn't work for me. And, right? And, and, and the problem is, is just like Brother Walt saying, this fella, you know, Brother Isles, I don't know if you know Brother Jack Isles. I got to hear him preach before he passed, but, I heard. you know, whenever that Brother Jack was, he, he was a different kind of, God just gave him graces to be able to do things and get away with things and boldness that most folks don't have. And you either loved him or hated him. I mean, that's literally the way it was. And, and, and there was a reason that he was doing those things. But when he shared that, what he's saying is this young, this young Christian boy has thought, well, if this old preacher did it, well, I'm doing it too. But the thing is, what, what is he praying about? Did he just go out there and pray because that was a, a check mark in the box? Well, if you're going to be a good, powerful Christian, you need to do this. Well, God's word isn't quite like that. God's word is directing all of us to deny ourselves. Now, here's the thing that begins to differentiate it. I've got my list of things that I've got to deny. Uh, I was rodeoing really heavy whenever the Lord started dealing with me and calling me to preach. And I'm like, man, but Lord, but Lord, I mean, I argued with him for a long time. And I will never forget when I, the Lord, I was on that side about where Miss Nicole is right there, and God got a hold of me, and I was like, Lord, I, they're not mine. You give them to me. And I came up here, and I literally, uh, spiritually speaking, I came up and laid them on the altar and said, here they are. You know, they're yours. What do you need me to do? Here am I. And at that, mom, at that moment, I felt like, that I was going to have to sell the horses. Now, I know that my wife remembers this well. And I came home and I thought, well, I guess it's just time to get rid of them. So I started selling them. And then I started getting these calls. So I sold one or two and I thought, well, I'm going to whittle down the herd. I get these two calls and I was given two really good ones back. I didn't have to buy them. God gave them back to me. And I'm thinking, now... Wait a minute, I, I thought I was supposed to get rid of these. And then that's when the Lord, I began to understand the Lord was teaching me. No, son, I give them to you. But the problem was they was before me. That's right. I couldn't use you until you were willing to get rid of them. And then when I give them back to you, you just got to make sure you keep them in perspective. Yeah. And it, it, that's the same way with everything about our lives. Isaac. That's right. When I lay my Isaac down, a broken heart, but my father's proud. <laughs> and on this altar, here he lays, justified it wasn't him. God wanted me. That's that song that I sing. 
And that's the true, that's the, that's the fruit of that song being showed to us right there. It, it, it was it him. God didn't want Isaac. God wanted Abraham. And he knew until Abraham laid Isaac down, he could never have Abraham. But when Abraham was willing to give up that gift, that most precious gift, then God says, that's okay. Now you've got it in the right perspective. What an amazing thing. Amen. Amen. What an amazing thing. Let's read these verses. Verse 23, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any man, any man or woman will come after me, let him deny himself or herself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he gain the whole, notice this word, world, and lose his own soul? You see, what is it that we run after? And I'm trying not to step all over the morning's message so that we'll stay focused, but what is it we're running after? He says love. He didn't. When he says love not, we ought to be anxious and ready to listen. And he says love not the world. The world. He says, yeah, neither the things that are in the world. And, and, and we, it, it, it can be really confusing. Matter of fact, I've had folks come to me. Are we not supposed to love the earth? And I'm like, oh, no, no. That's not talking about that world. God made the, the heavens and the earth and said it, it was good. That's cosmos. All right? And, and, then, and then they said, so are we not supposed to love mankind? And I said, no. That's not what he's saying either. Why? Because he says, for God so loved the world, mankind. Matter of fact, the two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor, neighbor as yourself. That's the person. Well, how am I supposed to love not the world if I don't hate the earth and I don't hate my fellow man? What, what does that mean? It's talking about the world system. There is a world system that literally draws us in and entices us. And that world system is what we can't love. And that's why that we deny ourselves. Taking up our cross means that I'm going to do what the Lord Jesus says, not what the world says. I'm going to do what he directs, not what the world says is cool or hip or in or faddish or right. I'm going to do what the Bible says is right. And that's me taking up my cross. In verse 25, he says, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. That's why you often hear me saying under the pulpit, I've got a salt shaker. And you know how I always say that salt shaker Christian. The salt shaker Christian just tries to sprinkle a little Jesus on their life and say, I'm good. But the Lord Jesus never teaches that. He says, if you have believed in me, if your faith is in me, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. That means I don't just sprinkle a little Jesus on my life. He becomes my life. I, I, I don't just see where he fits in, as I shared earlier. I, he becomes my life, and the things of this earth fit in. Think about the hymns that's been written. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. This is the, back at the beginning of that verse. And he says, in the things of this world, or the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And then when the, the, the clearer and the more and the fuller we see him, guess what? The, the less that this world is enticing anymore. The riches that, that I don't have the, let me, let me read that again. The, the, listen at the, at the food for thought. Having riches without Christ is dangerous. All right? Having Christ without riches is impossible. Riches monetarily without Christ is dangerous. Right? And that's why he said it's easier for a camel to pass uh, through an eye of a needle than a rich man that gates of heaven. And I know all the analogies given there. But he says having Christ without riches is impossible. You, these things that we've got to focus on are the glories that God promises. Let's look at one verse and then we'll be done. Hebrews chapter 11, Hall of Faith. We looked at this the other day and it's talking about a man named Moses and you know who he is. God used him to, God preserved him whenever that uh, Herod was killing all the babies. 
And then all of a sudden, before you know it, he's raised up in Pharaoh's house. And Moses literally had, he had literally all the riches of Egypt at his fingertips. All right? You know how a daughter has daddy wrapped around her little finger, right? Ain't that right, Brother Tim? That's right. All right. And, and because of that, well, guess what? Moses was declared to be the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So whatever his daughter asked for, son, all, all, all Moses had to do is go and say, Mom, you know, I would really like to have 10,000 more camels. It would have been done. Whatever he wanted. Mom, I, I really would like to have 40 billion in gold. It was done. But when Moses realized what God was drawing and using him for, listen to what happened. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. But by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Right? So that, and you would, by faith, they just knew that God was going to use him. So they, they set him aside. God preserved him. Now look what happens. Now Moses is grown. Verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, that means when he was grown, right, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And you would be like, well, why? Verse 25. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Yeah. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, here's that word, Brother Gary, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. He knew that the reward of Christ was much greater riches than all the gold that Egypt had to offer. And that's the thing that we've got to get to. Is it easy? No, it's only something God can teach us. It's only something that God can draw us to that when we deny ourselves and say, Lord, I don't want this anymore. It's yours. I want you. Then we begin to realize the riches. And that's why that the latter part of our food for thought says, having Christ without riches is impossible. Being a salt shaker Christian is possible. Having Christ and knowing him. We, we often, well, there's a, actually a hymn in our red, red back book and it says, uh, I just went blank. The hymn. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And once we know whom we believe, you know, that, that's what always bothers me and it scares me with these young folks. You know, you could just, we literally could coerce and convince them to say, okay, now say these words, okay? And, and, and they could say the words, but they, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know who they're praying to. They don't know who they're, who they're believing in. But when God gets a hold of them, and he opens their eyes that they're a sinner and they want forgiveness and they realize the only way of forgiveness is by believing on God's son and his name is Jesus. And the way they got forgiveness is that Jesus died for their sins, was buried and rose again. And they know whom they believed and they're persuaded that he is able to keep that which they committed unto him against that day. Then it's a relationship. Amen. Religious practices are just checking off the boxes. A relationship is knowing him and the power of his resurrection. Amen. Amen. Let's close. Heavenly Father, we pray.